This is Talk Business and Politics with Roby Brock. Welcome to the program. I'm Roby Brock, and we appreciate you tuning in. In the last month, President Donald Trump has learned that sometimes you can dictate foreign affairs, and sometimes they dictate you. Senator Tom Cotton, who sits on the Armed Services and Intelligence Committees, is widely looked to for his opinion on international developments. He was in studio earlier this week for an in-depth conversation about several red zones around the world. Let's begin with North Korea. Obviously a lot of saber rattling coming from the North Korean administration there. Is there still space for a diplomatic solution in North Korea? And if so, what does that entail? What does it look like? Well, there's some space, Roby, but we're running out of space. You know, for 25 years, through three presidencies, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, our policy has been essentially to kick the can down the road. And maybe that was a sensible policy back in the 1990s and the 2000s, but we're rapidly running out of road to kick the can. And President Obama said that to President Trump during the transition. Right. Um, so the best intelligence uh, that we have suggests that North Korea cannot yet marry up its nuclear technology on the one hand and its missile technology on the other hand, but both are progressing rapidly. And I don't think we can live in a world where North Korea can hold at risk hundreds of millions of Americans with a nuclear armed missile. So the only acceptable diplomatic outcome for the United States is that North Korea denuclearizes. And that's one reason why President Trump uh, has worked so closely with the Chinese government so they can bring pressure to bear since they you know, conduct 90% of all of North Korea's trade, provide so much of North Korea's ener energy, provide so much of their security guarantees. Ultimately, it will require China bringing some of that pressure to bear on North Korea. Do you see it moving in that direction? Do you see Chinese leaders making some sort of moves to make that happen? More so than we have uh, in recent times. Um, now, I, I think some of the steps they've taken, like suspending coal imports from North Korea, are largely symbolic. And President Trump needs to continue to put pressure on the president of China to take further substantial actions to make it clear to the Kim regime in North Korea that the United States is not going to live with a nuclear armed North Korea that can strike the United States of America. And, and if, if China wants to stop us from doing things that are as offensive to their interests, like deploying advanced ballistic missile defenses to South Korea, because we have them there for the North Korean threat, but of course China views them as a threat to them as well, it's in their interest to work with us to denuclearize North Korea. Is there a time frame on this? Does it get to the point, or is the time frame before North Korea has nuclear capabilities and it marries up with their missile technology? That's the, that's the key issue. Um, you know, they've been testing ballistic missiles for decades. They've been testing nuclear warheads for 11 years now. And we simply can't take the risk that they are able to perfect the technology that puts a nuclear warhead on an intercontinental missile that can reach the United States of America. And I would simply say that our government doesn't have a great history of getting these assessments right. Consistently over time, we have um, underestimated or overestimated assessments about nuclear programs, whether the Soviet Union or China or Iraq twice uh, and so forth. So we need to err on the side of caution here, which means moving faster, not moving slower. Let's turn our attention to the Middle East. Let's talk about Iran. Just this past week, we have seen the Trump administration, I think it was Rex, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, certify that Iran is in compliance uh, with the nuclear deal that you've been so critical of that uh, President Obama passed. Why did the Trump administration certify that deal um, if you still say that there are problems uh, with a potential nuclear Iran? Well, the fundamental problem with Iran is not their nuclear program, but the nature of their regime. It is a radical theocracy that tries to export uh, its worldview throughout the Middle East. Um, you know, nuclear weapons are just another kind of weapon. And we have other countries that possess nuclear weapons that we don't view as a threat, countries like the United Kingdom and France. The problem is the nature of the regime in Iran. And you can see that not only in their nuclear weapons program, but in their campaign of regional or of imperial aggression throughout the region, the support for insurgencies in Iraq or in Yemen for terrorist groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon. Also, they're testing of ballistic missiles, their atrocious human rights record. Um, ultimately, we cannot let a regime like that obtain nuclear weapons. How do you so change wh a you regime? I mean, you, you can't do that. And you're probably not advocating an overthrow of the current regime. I mean, well, there have been opportunities in the past that the United States missed. For instance, in 2009, uh, during uh, protests about a stolen election, uh, 
the Obama administration, unfortunately, didn't support that protest movement. It turned uh, the other cheek, supported the Ayatollahs, in part because President Obama was uh, pursuing this flawed nuclear deal. We should make every effort, though, to call into question the legitimacy of the Ayatollah's reign, just like we did uh, in the Soviet Union to the Communist Party uh, in the so or in the Cold War to the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, and support those peoples within their own country who want to see a different government, a government that will bring peace and stability, not a government that will continue this campaign of regional aggression. Seems like a long shot, though, that that is going to happen. I mean, a there's not an uprising really underway right now, so there is not a group to throw that kind of support to, and it seems like to do what you're advocating is going to be seen as very antagonistic, obviously, by the current regime in Iran. So uh, how do you realistically well, make we, that happen? So, so it's largely a fact-based question whether Iran is or is not complying uh, with that uh, nuclear deal. Um, but the president said in that certification letter that they're undertaking a broader review of, of Iran's behavior on all fronts and that it may warrant additional sanctions. It may also warrant additional action in the Middle East to support our allies who are trying to confront Iran's campaign of imperial aggression, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or Israel and so forth. Uh, that's one thing that we lost during the Obama era is a consistent confrontation to aggressive adversaries like Iran. That's what we had in the late Soviet Union. Uh, or with the late Soviet Union in the 1980s and early 1990s. And, and if you recall, in, in 1989, the Soviet Union was still intact, the Warsaw Pact was in intact, but from elections in Poland to just a few months later, every communist government in Eastern Europe fell. So the engine of history can move pretty fast if the United States exercises that kind of leadership it was largely in the world. economic, though, is what was driving a lot of that. There well, was political change, but there was also the weight of the communist economy was cratering. And that's an example of what I mean of consistent pressure across all fronts. Uh, you know, Iran came to the negotiating table in 2013 because of sanctions. Uh, now, unfortunately, the way that nuclear deal was structured, they have a lot of the benefit up front. They have $150 billion cash, dollars in sanctions right. relief. They've got millions and millions of dollars in straight cash from the United States government, Swiss francs and euros flown in the dark of night into Iran. But that doesn't mean that we can't impose new sanctions. Uh, and we can impose sanctions under the nuclear deal for non-nuclear activities, for things like supporting insurgencies against our allies or supporting terrorism. That? Are you pushing for I, that now? I, I already support legislation with a bipartisan group of senators to do just that. Let's move to Syria. What's next in the equation for Syria? Um, what, what do you see happening next on that level? Well, the, you know, the president said uh, in his speech after they, uh, we conducted those airstrikes into the airfield that launched that terrible poison gas against innocent Syrians, including children and babies, that we simply are not going to tolerate countries that have signed the Chemical Weapons Convention deploying weapons of mass destruction in a country where we have hundreds of American troops on the ground and thousands of our uh, allies' troops. So President Trump said that this is, no, he should say, he didn't say that this is a campaign to overthrow the Assad regime, that this is going to lead to the occupation of Syria for a decade, that we're going to try to bring Jeffersonian democracy to Damascus. He was uh, sending Damascus. a signal that He's, we will take action. He said, if, if you, you use chemical weapons, like this, right? we will, we'll strike you again. And as Jim Mattis said, I suspect Bashar al-Assad regrets that decision and he won't do so again, which is not just a humanitarian gesture, but it's important for the troops that we have on the ground there. Now, they're undertaking a broader review of all Syria policy inside the administration. As Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has said, uh, it's hard to see how the Assad family remains in power, not as a matter of American policy only, but simply as a matter of the facts on the ground. You have millions of Syrians who have been resisting and fighting his government now for six years. You have most of our allies in the region doing the same thing. There ultimately will have to be a political solution. It's hard to see how that political solution is the Assad family remaining in power. Do you have any other insight on what that political solution may be? Well, ultimately, political solutions come about through diplomatic negotiations. Um, but I think one core flaw of the Obama administration's policy in Syria, but really more broadly around the world, is they didn't see uh, the way to marry up pressure and sometimes force with diplomacy. You know, our best presidents have been able to do that. You know, President Reagan, for instance, confronted Soviet aggression in Afghanistan and Angola and Nicaragua and all around the world. He built up our military. 
Uh, he used our economic might at the same time that he sent his own Secretary of State, George Shultz, to negotiate repeatedly with Soviet leaders. So you can both put pressure in, on uh, our adversaries and confront our adversaries while also negotiating with them. And that's why I think it was a good thing that Secretary of State Tillerson continued on his trip to Moscow the following week. Moscow is the main patron of Bashar al-Assad, and he pulled no punches uh, when he was in their uh, oh, Russia's was capital successful? city. Was it successful in putting that pressure on there? Or is this such a long haul effort that is going to have to be done is we're not going to see any kind of even small success or movement for many well, years given, to come. Given Russia's relatively muted reaction uh, since those strikes, I do believe it was successful. Look, uh, President Trump did in one night what President Putin of Russia has done to three straight presidents uh, for 15 or 20 years. He wrong footed him and put him in an impossible situation. Either he has to back down and lose face all around the world to be shown powerless to defend his own clients, or he has to escalate in a way that he does not have the military or the economy to support and that strains uh, his interest in other regions as well. That's one reason why I think you've seen such a muted response. Let's come back to the Western Hemisphere for our last topic on international affairs. Let's talk about Cuba and where things are at Cuba. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of Arkansans, and even Senator John Bozeman has been supportive of opening up more trade options uh, with Cuba, particularly for Arkansas rice, Arkansas poultry. You've been resistant to much movement in Cuba because you want to see certain things happen first. Are you getting more warmed to that situation? Do you see some progress being made that would convince you to maybe support things as much as Senator Bozeman's doing? I, I would be very happy to see a day in which we can trade freely with the uh, Cuban people and we can sell our rice and our poultry and our other products into Cuba, travel there freely and vice versa. But right now you really can't do that. If you're doing business in Cuba, your uh, money is basically going to the Castro regime. And this is not simply a matter of, of humanitarian protection of the liberty of the Cuban people. This is about our core interest. Uh, the Cuban intelligence services are one of the most hostile adver adversarial services in the world. They rank up there with Russia and China and Iran against the interest of the United States. I, I can't get into all the details, but I can assure you that Cuban intelligence services are constantly working against the interest of the United States and of our citizens. Uh, and until that changes, uh, it's hard for me to see supporting those kind of expanded ties with Cuba. And that's Senator Tom Cotton. You can catch his full interview on our website at talkbusiness.net. There's also a second interview with Senator Cotton uh, where we discuss President Trump's first 100 days in office. That was a follow-up to a program at the Clinton School of Public Service this past week. And next week, we'll roll out thoughts from Cotton on some banking-related topics. He's on the Senate Banking Committee. You can catch all of that at talkbusiness.net. A word from our sponsors, and we're back with a tribute to the late Congressman Jay Dickey and our roundtable conversation on this week's state executions.